Uh, hi folks, uh, my name is Sunku Ranganath um, and I work for Intel in the data plane software engineering team. Um, so you, right now you would see a few handouts being uh, given out by MJ. Um, so the idea is, um, and also in the previous talk you saw the, uh, the um, leveraging data, what could you build on using machine learning and AI. Um, in this uh, session, you would get introduced to the software um, that you could build on to get the, so get the relevant telemetry and integrate it into the existing systems, uh, minor systems. Um, so the idea here is we have about 18 to 20 bare metal servers in the data center in New Mexico. So these just got formed, uh, freshly imaged uh, for us for this tutorial and uh, yesterday, today. Um, so um, it, since it's bare metal and the service uh, and the software, like it's uh, one instance per node, uh, so you'd have to use one whole node for yourself. Um, so from that sense, there are about 18 to 20 systems uh, that uh, you could use. So if, if you're, someone is running out of them, uh, the number of uh, systems, if you're limited, like please share with someone else who is running it, and then also run it live over here uh, in parallel with you uh, so that you get an idea of uh, what we are doing. Uh, so there are uh, three sub-demos overall, uh, sub-hands-on labs overall, and uh, we have about uh, one and a half hours, so I'm pretty sure we can get through that. Um, so I'll introduce you to what we are talking about in a few slides, and then um, we'll do a hands-on session as we go. All right, so important slide, legal disclaimer. Um, thanks to our team um, uh, to make this happen, all the work that we are doing. So here's a sample agenda of uh, what we'll be covering uh, with respect to service assurance and what is available today, especially in the open source world, to gather the data and feed the data ask, uh, and, and uh, integrate the data into um, uh, Etsy or NFE deployments, basically. Um, and how, how does it fit into closed-loop automation? So um, you would have some of this material kind of resonates with the story Emma and uh, Tong alluded to. I'll kind of introduce you the background of uh, service assurance and how it fits into the closed-loop automation. Um, you know, if you really look at understanding this, uh, what is um, service assurance? In a simple way, if you want to define it, uh, application of a set of policies or processes to ensure uh, the services offered over network meet a predefined uh, service quality level for optimal user experience or subscriber experience. Right. So, if you map it to um, SCNFE fr um, framework, SCNFE layers. Right. So you have multiple layers across here. Um, So um, you have the NFEI layer at the bottom where you have hardware and the virtualization software, all of that available. On top of that, you have um, uh, VNF manager, VNF functions running. On top of that, you have um, uh, infrastructure and service VNF management layers. On the right, you see VNF manager, uh, Vim at the bottom managing the hardware, um, and then the orchestrator uh, looking at the service side of things. And on top, you have, um, um, you know, so the, the overall right side being the mano, um, mano layers, right? So in, in this case, like if you look at the overall deployment, um, if you considering the telemetry side of things, right? Um, so you have various layers of telemetry that you want to consider. For example, um, service assurance focuses a lot on FCAPs, right? So fault, configuration, accounting, performance, security, a lot of these attributes are crucial for service assurance, and how do you understand the state of the system uh, or your distributed system uh, for you to understand, like, okay, uh, what are the FCAPS components, that's, uh, what is going on in these components? And from that perspective, you have various layers of telemetry and data that you have to understand and analyze. I said the um, um, NFEI layer infrastructure layer, you have platform telemetry um, originating from individual nodes. Um, and traffic telemetry and uh, giving you a state of the network traffic uh, that's going on. And the application telemetry, which is used, leveraged for your service layer, understanding what's going on across your service. So, um, and then the state of, um, uh, of the whole manual deployment. And so the tradition, ideally, like all of these are uh, in, uh, fed into a central place, like for example, a database where you can look into on, um, processing this data, uh, applying any algorithms if you want to on top and feeding into 
um, your um, uh, uh, network operation management center, right? So where you have guidance agent, which is where policy and all these details come in. So, um, if, but if you look at it, each layer, there are thousands of metrics per second that you could generate. And it's hugely complex to understand. I mean, for each node, for example, I'll touch upon some of this telemetry in the next slides. Each node, you could easily generate hundreds of metrics just on the hardware side of things. Then you have your traffic, you have your services. The complexity adds up as you go higher in the layer to put this all together and figure out, okay, how does it affect the application that I'm running or the service that I'm running across the cluster? Um, so if you uh, want to figure out like how do you um, implement a service assurance platform, uh, three key components that would come into play. Uh, one is monitoring, uh, which is where you have to um, figure out like getting the data, enabling, it enables deeper management and tracking of specific service levels. So platform counters, network counters, and a lot of this come into play. Um, and then there is presentation, uh, where you're uh, reporting out, you're figuring out your trending, um, your, your uh, visualization part. Um, so it, this, this is a key part in not only getting the data, in basically uh, making sense of the data. And this is a key to support the, uh, you know, detecting and um, configuring the parameters based on like, okay, what you've seen, right? So it's, this layer is important too. And then, then provisioning, and uh, this is where, based on a policy, you understand the data and uh, you change your uh, resources, you change your service levels to, in order to meet the particular SLA uh, service level agreement. And a lot of um, factors across this layers, like your platform, for example, CPU, memory, cache, uh, and then the application telemetry, network telemetry, all of this come into play. So um, from our side, like what the approach we took, uh, we've been working on uh, putting these things together uh, for a couple of years now. Um, in a phase one um, is un understand the, no the platform, understand the node, right? So, um, and this is where you have a lot of this telemetry across the platform that you wanna get out and uh, uh, have a way to not only retrieve it, but store it, understand it. And then phase two is about um, integrating with the manual layers. Like uh, this is where your um, things like your OpenStack or, or Kubernetes or, or, or orchestrators come into play. And how would these be integrated? Like what are the um, various ways like alarms or you know, fault management ways? Like or how can this be done across your cluster? Right? So that's, that's second phase. And third phase is uh, predictive platform service assurance, which is what we, uh, a few of the talks today focusing on. Right, so there's quite some work done in the first two phases in the open source community, for example, um, I, and uh, uh, there are mechanisms in place where uh, you can close the loop, you can um, more, more of a reactive ways of doing things. There are already a lot of uh, services in the, within the orchestrators that, that can help you do this. Um, however, phase three, it's, it's where we're building up the momentum and uh, that's where um, you know, the next step is in terms of predicting where the faults or issues are gonna be and taking the corresponding corrective action. Um, if you're in the cloud side of the world, um, and of course we are talking about telco applications and telco deployments, NFE, et cetera. If you're in the cloud side of the world, um, you would hear this term about observability. Right, so, um, and observability encompasses a little more, or, or actually there are two different independent topics, but observability is about exposing the state of the platform uh, to, so that you can figure out whether the service level objectives are met. And observability um, comes into play when you're talking about uh, logging, uh, metrics that you're monitoring, tracing, now, all these factors come into play uh, with observability. And uh, CNCF, uh, Cloud Native Compute Foundation, have some good projects in terms of logging or tracing, uh, Jaeger, a lot of these projects come into play in terms of observability, right? So from um, um, communication service provider perspective, you not only need to figure out your observability, but uh, have to find a way in order to ensure your service assurance, um, uh, service levels are Met and service assurance is there, right? So, and that's where um, both uh, monitoring and observability are crucial. Um, however, the time um, time of processing and time you 
take corrective action. The amount of time it takes is very crucial for um, telco environments as compared to cloud environment, right? So if you are uh, dialing a classic example of 911 call, you want to ensure the 5.9 availability of service uh, in order to um, have that call happening. And um, there's only so much bandwidth that you can, uh, or le leeway that you can take. Right? So that's where um, uh, service assurance encompasses the aspects of observability. And um, this was introduced to you a few minutes back, a closed loop, right? So um, it, today we're going to touch upon um, the bottom layer here, uh, getting the data metrics and how do you integrate with uh, um, uh, some of the frameworks to transport the data from the platform, right? So however, um, in order to enable these closed loops across manual layer and your business layer, right? So um, we're working on um, some of these aspects of uh, uh, local telemetry, local platform telemetry agents, um, or uh, agents that can understand this telemetry and take corrective actions within the platform instead of sending it out uh, to a central node within the cluster or outside of the cluster uh, for you to take the corrective action. So uh, there are various layers of closed loops that you can look at, uh, and I'll touch upon it uh, soon. Um, so I'll start uh, by digging into the monitor. Yes, yeah, the um, slides would be posted on a um, uh, uh, meetup site, I believe. Uh, last time it was done, so, so I'm assuming the same here. Yeah, so I'll start off with the monitoring part um, so that you can understand how you can get the data out. Um, we use, um, and what you're seeing is um, our team, we heavily focus on open source um, metrics uh, monitoring software um, called CollectD. And we, what we've seen, a lot of our customers, partners, we're working with heavily leveraged CollectD. Um, CollectD has been there for 10 plus years. Um, it has a lot of uh, um, plugins and a lot of uh, contributions that provide you tons of metrics. It's a statistics collection daemon, uh, a simple daemon that's running, um, you know, getting um, the, it, it has a concept of northbound and southbound. Uh, so basically it gets the, um, metrics from the platform or the application you're monitoring and, and then ex send it out across the network or across a HTTP call or a REST call um, out to whoever is registered to it. Right, so it's wide, open source, widely adopted, um, use a con reads a read or write plugins. It reads the metrics and writes to a, a same node or remote endpoint. Um, and configurable collection interval, uh, one second, 10 seconds, minutes, uh, you can configure a simple configuration file. Uh, variety of plugins, input, output plugins, binding, logging plugins, notifications, et cetera. And uh, uh, we contribute to the open source upstream uh, of CollectD project, and there are tons of plugins available. Um, building the slide on top of uh, what Emma presented uh, previously, um, you know, so what you saw here is a whole bunch of plugins here, a whole bunch of data that you can retrieve uh, just from a single node, for example. Uh, let's see if I can move my mouse here. Yeah, great. Um, so going from bottom to the top, right, so bottom up, um, if you divide your platform compute network storage, um, in terms of compute, uh, there are quite a few metrics that you could get. Um, it's something called run share technology that provides you faults and errors on the hardware, uh, your memory errors or PCI errors, et cetera. So basically this is about your resiliency of the platform. And uh, so there's something called RAS, uh, reliability, availability, serviceability metrics that you can leverage from here. Uh, resource director technology uh, that we just saw you're getting uh, cache metrics, uh, last level cache metrics, or memory bandwidth metrics, et cetera, that you can expose to. Um, and then the power part, uh, your frequency metrics per core level or changing your frequency, et cetera. So that's your power metrics. Uh, if you look at the Redfish, uh, sorry, uh, before you go to Redfish, the network side, um, um, you can get a, a out of band metrics with IPMI, for example, or a lot of counters across your NIC or NIC ports, um, and then the performance monitoring unit that provides a lot of metrics about the platform, overall state of the platform. In terms of storage, um, ARRAID, NVMEs, um, uh, SSD metrics, smart metrics, 
right? So a lot of these metrics here. So depending on the application that you choose to deploy, um, combination or a subset of these metrics play a crucial role in understanding what's going on on the platform, right? And um, we've done plugins for a lot of this, uh, especially in green. Um, there's a plugin for each of these in, in CollectD. And um, now, once you read these metrics, how do you expose it to your deployments? How do you send it out? Right? So, and that's where um, we've done quite some work. Um, so you could do fast path, like local correct to action, uh, right? so where you have an agent um, sitting on the same node, understanding these metrics, figuring out what's the right SLA and policy, and then changing the, um, the resource management within the platform, um, or, um, you know, or sending it out, uh, for example, out of band. Um, In-band is something, lo uh, getting it locally to the node and leveraging it. Out-of-band is something you're exporting out, um, out of the main, um, uh, without any um, interference from operating system, you're sending the metrics out. Uh, for example, that's where you have IPMI or Redfish, uh, which is a recent protocol. You can have, leverage Redfish to get all the metrics out in, into some, write it, play, write it to a place where you can process these metrics. If you look at the virtualization layer here, you know, in a virtual machine type environment, your hypervisor, for example, we have a plugin called LibVirt plugin that exposes a lot of details about your virtualized deployment, your compute network storage, and um, uh, like OpenStack, for example, heavily leverages it. Um, so now you have all these metrics, now how do you send it out? Um, so OpenStack, we did uh, work to integrate in um, so that you can, uh, uh, services like AODH, Vitraj can leverage it so that you can, based on the metrics, you can send alarms and, and then OpenStack services can um, take corresponding action using those alarms. Um, or we have integration with Prometheus and Kafka. Um, these are a couple of fr um, frameworks we're gonna touch upon in the ne next slides and we have a hands-on for them. And uh, so overall, and if you, um, understand, uh, if you look at this picture, if you're someone who's uh, figuring out to deploy your services uh, on compute nodes, um, you have to figure out, like from a service assurance perspective, a lot of these factors that can impact your service deployment, not just deployment, service operation. And um, uh, understanding these and using these would play, uh, would not just uh, managing your services better, but also in terms of cost savings, right? So. If your compute is unused, you can probably deploy something else on top of here. Right, so if your uh, network bandwidth is very low and you don't have a lot of applications using network bandwidth, they can, if, maybe you can deploy a network intensive uh, application here apart from the applications that are already on there. So understanding these metrics um, can heavily impact your, um, your resource management, um, right? So all of your FCAPS components and uh, you can, um, like in the previous slide, uh, in the previous talk, um, we, we, uh, Tong talked about data pre-processing, right? So there's a lot of data that comes from this that you have to understand and pre-process in order for you to feed into your algorithms uh, to get the right info out. Um, so this few tables here that goes into a lot more details of what those plugins are, but these slides would be available for you, uh, for you to uh, use them and um, build on top. Example, I talk about um, RDT, et cetera. However, there are plugins for virtual switch, open v switch, and uh, DPDK uh, for collect deep plugins that can give, send out the metrics of what's happening within an OVS, what's happening in, in your DPDK deployment, and there are quite a few plugins there. Um, and then um, PMU plugin, Redfish plugin, storage plugin, so a lot of this. Um, has still work, there's a lot of work ongoing still and a lot of work um, uh, that has been done and that you can leverage. So open source software, so you can leverage it right off the bat. And these are some northbound plugins um, writing to OpenStack services like Gnocchi, uh, Kafka, Prometheus, uh, right? So you have a lot of ways that you can feed that data in. Um, your simple network plugin sends out these metrics across the UDP packets, HTTP plugin sends out a REST call, et cetera. So um, let me introduce you to a somewhat different um, uh, project called OPNV Barometer. So what you saw right now is just an open source software. However, um, under OPNV 
project. Uh, how many of you know here OpenAV? Okay, that's uh, quite a few. That's great. Um, OpenAV is an open platform for NAV, and uh, it's it's been an uh, open source project for quite a few years now. And uh, OpenAV composes of various projects. It's basically a common uh, set of projects providing you relevant tools, uh, frameworks for testing, integration, uh, validation of your NFV deployments. Um, and, um, and they have a um, huge set of tools, tool sets that you can leverage uh, for your NFV deployment. One, one of the projects within OPNV um, is Barometer. Um, Barometer, as it indicates, it represents like the state of, uh, what, state of your system. So what, under this project, what we did was, uh, hey, collect these available, great, but how can uh, someone in the NFE space can leverage it? How can they use it? And that's where we've done uh, quite a bit of packaging um, uh, around collect D and also customization so that you have an open source reference right off the bat available for you that you can leverage, right? So um, you can, um, we customize it in such a way that um, you know you can uh, deploy it easily. That we have something called one-click install, basically a set of Ansible scripts, uh, where um, just by using them you deploy ColecD, deploy InfluxDB, Prometheus, and uh, um, you have the metrics and uh, all the events that are coming out of the platform represented well for you in Grafana. And we have a hands-on lab on this, so next coming up, um, so so you would, you would understand how easy it is and under. 10 minutes, right? So you can deploy all of this and start uh, figuring out the state of the platform of what's going on uh, on your bare metal node. And um, um, so what we have is um, um, we, we, figure, we put out a few containers onto Docker Hub, uh, ColecD container, uh, InfluxDB container, um, et cetera. So under OpenAV parameter, you, you can download these containers so that you have reference software uh, readily available for you. Some of our customers uh, who are getting into this field, like it's a, this is a first touch point where they can directly take the work that is already open source work that's there, start understanding and so that they can think, plan for their production environment. And um, there are three containers, uh, stable container. Um, before I probably go there, so once you deploy it, right, so the one click install, maybe I explain this picture, um, you can, in, in reality, there are a bunch of compute nodes. So you deploy a collect D on, on your compute node. It can send out the metrics onto your controller node, for example, right? So where you have your data processing, et cetera, done here. And um, in, in a uh, distributor system setup, you have collect D here, influx, send to influx DB, cross this port, and uh, Grafana can um, put it out in a graph in, in a central controller across all of the, a lot of these nodes. For our lab that's coming up, we would do all of this in the same node, so that's easy to deploy and for you to understand what happens when you deploy ColecD, InfluxDB, uh, and uh, Grafana. Right, so um, InfluxDB, um, if for the folks who don't know, it's uh, one of the time series database. Um, so when it comes to these metrics, right, so you want to understand them and process them uh, in uh, in the shortest time possible. And the metric is, doesn't mean much. CPU utilization as a metric, for example, doesn't mean much if you don't correlate with an instant in time. Right? So at this instant in time, this, this, is, this was the state of my system. And that's where time series database uh, really helps to figure out this, not just the value, but also the, the corresponding time, uh, because it processes in a key value pair mechanism. Uh, quite a few time series database out there. Um, InfluxDB is a pretty popular one. It's open source. Uh, you can download and leverage. And Grafana is a, a visualization tool. It's a pretty easy to use. It, it can plot a lot of data and customize the graphs in the way you want. Uh, as we go, um, it's, uh, you will see how easy it is to use and deploy. Um, and uh, if you're someone thinking of using it uh, for, for testing, um, Collect D, the, in, in the community until recently, the um, cadence of release of Collect D was kind of unpredictable, and it's changing this year. Um, but uh, so that's where we have uh, three ways, three containers, that is something stable, like the recent release of ColecD, master container, all the features in the master branch of ColecD, so you can um, uh, use this container to get the, all the latest uh, features out there, or latest plugins out there, and then there's experimental container where 
if we cherry pick some of the uh, pull requests or some of the features that are not merged in yet and then showcase it in this container. So if you want to test it, understand the new features that are coming up. Um, so how is that useful for you? So as a microservice, you know, it's um, leveraging this, easy to deploy, easy to scale across multiple nodes, easy to uh, experiment and figure out how it helps for you. Um, and under Barometer, we haven't done ju not just InfluxDB or Grafana, but we have integration with Kafka, uh, VES, VNF event stream, uh, Prometheus, et cetera. So in our hands-on lab today, uh, we'll go through these three labs so for you to understand what this is. Um, it's easily scalable for you, for you to leverage. And um, like I said, the Ansible support, um, you can do a lot of this uh, and um, uh, e test it for you know, before you do it in production. Um, in terms of upstream and downstream, uh, we touched upon the three containers here. And then in terms of downstream, uh, which is basically um, having this in uh, for you to use across Red Hat products or canonical products, uh, we closely tie, we have a close tie with uh, Red Hat and Red Hat OSP OpenStack platform leverages uh, this work, uh, these CollectD packages. And um, if you deploy OSP and in your production environment, CollectD is a package that comes with it. And have, you have a good integration there so that you can start leveraging it. Um, and also, um, Canonical uses latest packages, um, latest CollectD release packages, and then you have uh, CollectD available through Canoni uh, Ubuntu dev packages. So let's go to a simple demo for you to, uh, or not just demo, hands-on, uh, for you to understand what this is. Um, so how many of you received the, um, the sheet this one here, okay, that's great. So I'll do it in parallels for you to understand. So this one um, uh, goes through how do you set up your uh, putty uh, for SSHing into the data center. It has a bunch of firewall rules, so we have a way to um, for you to access the data center nodes and start using them. And uh, this has a good set of instructions. Um, apart from setting up the um, setting up the SSH tunnels, uh, there is also a good um, uh, description of what we are going to do. Uh, it's right here. I have this Etherpad page uh, where a lot of these instructions are captured. Um, and this is in the sheet that I give in. In the last page, there is a link, Etherpad link, that you can open. As we go, you can copy paste the commands from this Etherpad if you prefer. Um, before I jump in, uh, one thing I want to point out, under OPNV, we have a, a lot of documentation available for you, quite a few wiki articles. Um, so if you just open OPNV Barometer one-click install guide, so it goes through a lot of commands of how do you, how do you use this, how, how can you deploy these scripts, or you have a user guide like detailing about how do you clone the repo, how can you build the container, uh, how, or pull the container and start using it. There are quite a few instructions that are available here and then the Docker install guide. Um, so there are a bunch of uh, instructions available here. So a lot of uh, work has gone in to put these things together and you can leverage it anytime. So um, coming to the demo. Um, so what I can do is I, I can open a new window, uh, start from scratch just to make it easy for folks here. Um, if you have Putty, I hope Everybody here like who wants to do hands-on have putty. You can download if you don't have it. Um, so you're given, um, there are two parts to this. One is a jump server virtual machine where you first log into. And from that virtual machine, you log into the actual bare metal node just to make it easy for, for to go around the firewall, et cetera, for the data center. So the first one um, in the thin strip that was given to you, uh, there is a place to log in to the first machine, 207, et cetera, an IP that was given in there. Um, use that uh, virtual machine or jump host to say, and log in there. Um, and it's, uh, I'll increase the font as, as I go over. But 207, 108, 8161, that's, for example, that's what I'm using. But something similar should, would be given to you in, in, the, in the sheet that is provided to you. Um, as you open it, Login using 
um, the user ID password that was given to you. And there is a two sets of user ID passwords. Um, there's one customized, it's unique to the person and also the one Ubuntu Ubuntu. Uh, that's for later accessing the node, but however, use the one that's the first one uh, that is given. So I have a, my own login, I'll use that. So right now we're just logging in, um, the changing the settings, et cetera, as given in this sheet. Uh, I'll go through as we do the demo. Um, so take it one step at a time. Um, so you, you would see that um, some of the settings need to be changed here. Um, keep alive seconds, how do you change it, et cetera, right? So you do a right click, change settings, and over here, the connections, you would see it. seven, apply, right? And then um, the tunnel part, I'll go through it a little later. Um, but however, uh, see if you can get access to this and uh, that should be good to go. And then from here, um, you would SSH into the individual node. Anybody have trouble yet or uh, so far so good? Uh, feel free to call me up if anybody have questions. And from then, uh, from there, you would log in SSH into the individual node IP that was given to you. Uh, this is 36, 101, et cetera, right? So mine is .30, um, so you'd have something like .20, .21, .22, something like that, so that you can SSH into this node, which is where um, you're logging into the actual bare metal node. This is what you have to use for uh, Ubuntu Ubuntu, that login, you use it here. I'll increase the font size to make it easy. Is this better? Yep, okay. So as soon as you log in, you should see something like this. Um, so this, uh, I, I tested on nearly 10 machines. Uh, I logged in individually. I tested in all, almost all of these to make sure it works. Um, but if it doesn't work, call me up. I can try and help you. Um, so if you, you would see this folder, uh, barometer. So I just cloned it from the upstream repo, git clone uh, barometer, and uh, you would see this. Um, and under this folder, um, you would see a Docker, um, utilities, right? So how do you configure Puppet, et cetera, so, uh, source code. Which, um, so quite, quite some CollectD work is available here. What we would do today is um, one-click install approach, and this would cover um, folks from various um, levels, like beginner to advanced user. If you're an advanced user, feel free to experiment. Um, I'll uh, keep it simple just to go over this hands-on. Uh, so it's CD into Docker, Ansible. You'd see these files, Ansible configuration, YAML files, etc. So once you're here, uh, before I dig in, any questions? Oh, okay. So in the default.inventory file, uh, default.inv, open it up, you would see um, some configuration. So here, the same inventory file could be used for our three three labs that we have. In the first lab, we would just go with the CollectD InfluxDB Grafana lab. So from that perspective, under this heading, CollectD host, um, update the IP of the node uh, that you're using. For you to get this IP address, all you have to do is IP A, and you will see this value right here. So, what we are doing is we are deploying all of these containers and services within the same node. So you want to ensure, provide this IP value in your inventory file. Default.inv, and um, uh, so there's some templated value there. Ensure it's the same one as your host. So that way it's available for you under CollectD, InfluxDB host, and Grafana host. And we want to ensure everything else is commented out, and we'll come back to this later. Once you have the IP address, 
So now what you do is um, you have a YAML file that would go through what we want to deploy. Um, so if you're doing it in your own environment, you have a, a few tasks here where um, you deploy these containers. Um, and if you look at it here, it, it can install Docker too, but Docker is already installed and all the packages are already installed, so I have this commented out. You have a set of tasks for, you, for um, ru running these, these few things. So from here, all that needs to be done is Execute this command, sudo fnh ansible playbook. So um, if you're having a tough time, uh, go back to this etherpad right here. So I've, set, I've given the instructions here, IPA, update the default and INV. You can copy paste this command right here. So executing the playbook and uh, with your inventory file and your YAML file, and it should make it easy for you. You can copy paste this in your command window. Enter the password. There is a chance the Docker daemon has, uh, might have some issues, but uh, when I tested it, um, the Docker daemon used to fail, so we, we restart it, it should be fine. Let's see how, it, how this goes. I hope our demo guards are with me today. So the Ansible scripts, it deploys all the plugins, and each of the plugins might have some dependencies. For example, RDT might uh, need a library called PQoS, or IPMI would need a relevant library. Right? Um, so a lot of these plugins, like libvirt, for example, word plugin checks if there is a libvirt installed. We don't have libvirt installed at this point, because it take, the complexity is a little bit high. So for this demo, we don't have libvirt installed. So if you see here, um, it says, like. Um, Somewhere here, uh, libvirt is not available, uh, et cetera. Libvirt, it checks for the daemon, it's not available. So a lot of this um, dependencies are already taken care. MC log is the one that I was talking about, uh, Runshare technology, which provides you uh, errors, uh, machine check errors on your platform. So it checks if this daemon is running. It's not in our case. Check, okay. So um, once you run the command, uh, your playbook completes, and I should see play recap success. Um, and I hope there's no failures over there. And what you can do now is sudo docker ps, and you would see three containers running, Barometer, Grafana, and FluxDB, and CollectD. So what we did is pull these containers from the Docker Hub and deployed them using the configuration, custom configuration, that we have in the Ansible scripts, and we have these three containers running. So CollectD is sending the data to InfluxDB, writing to a, a, the port um, where it's InfluxDB is listening, and then from InfluxDB to CollectD. Now what we want to do is like, hey, visualize what's happening in the Grafana. So for this, this is where you need some uh, port settings and uh, need to establish an SSH tunnel. Click on Chain Settings, SSH, Tunnels, and uh, the sheet that you have would provide you uh, information on how to set this up. Uh, once the connection is done, this second page gives you establishing um, tunnel. So what do you want to do here? Source port, you want to open up um, 13000. So Grafana writes the data output at port, port 3000. So we want to open up a port on your machine 13000, and, uh, and the destination would be the IP that you saw here, uh, 36 in my case is this one. In your case, the IP of the machine that you have, 36.101.15.30 and 4.3000. Add it right here. Uh, so you establish a tunnel, and uh, it should be straightforward for you. If you want me to wait, I can wait. But uh, all you do is this and uh, click Apply. 
And then next thing you do is open up a browser. Click on localhost, um, call in 13000, and enter. This is from your personal laptop, from, from your laptop, and there you have it. Um, you have the Grafana page opening up. Um, and the user and username and password is pretty simple, admin admin. Log in, and voila. Anybody hasn't reached here so far or any questions? Yeah. Your laptop is not connected to the net. You mean not connected to internet? Yeah, it's not connected to internet, and there are a bunch of firewall rules. So that's why we have this SSH uh, tunneling way to, for you to use it. Um, so you cannot ping it from your local laptop. That's a good point. Um, as long as you're connected to the guest network here, I think they opened up the port. Um, if it's not working with your VPN, with your company's VPN, I'd suggest disabling it temporarily um, because they opened the port to whoever is connected to the guest network here. Sorry, go ahead. So second one is Um, let's say here, so uh, are you able to log in to um, the 207 IP? Yeah, well, I just the first one that Okay, and uh, are, were you able to log into the, the second machine, which is 30 dot something? There's a small strip. Oh, second, uh, you just want to change the values here. All you do here is right click and change settings. You open up in something other than Putty? Another, um, no, you, need, you have to do it from the same, um, same Putty sh login, same Putty window. Yeah, so you're customizing the settings for the Putty window that you're using, which, that you logged in. I click connection. Probably I went too fast. Take a few minutes to uh, get this going, because we have two more demos that uses this, so we can make it quick. Uh, okay, so it's uh, restart the um, Docker. I uh, have a command here at the bottom, or uh, restart Docker. Uh, once you restart it, run the Ansible command again, and it should work. Hopefully it works. Be back. Thirteen dot one. Yeah, I think that's why. I'll give it a two, one minute. I'll come back. Anyone else can help? I'll wait, um, probably show you what's happening in the Grafana. Oh. So click on the top left here, and you'll see a bunch of uh, plugins and a bunch of data you can customize. And a host overview. Um, And you'd see, we put, it, put together a few JSON files um, so that you could see the, the metrics coming in for CPU usage, network utilization, traffic, et cetera. So I'll do, uh, checking this out, I'll quickly check if uh, anybody has questions.
Anyone else? Questions? Okay. I think probably the link uh, has changed in the 
a document here. Uh, could you type this in? I think it's the same, but I don't know. I can see it. I refresh the page, and I can see the instructions. Uh, could you try this again? Uh, etherpad, opnfe.org, uh, try this link. Uh, highlighted in, in here. It shows up to me. Yep, it's still there. Yeah, it's still there, yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't know why you're not able to see it. Uh, probably slash p slash telemetry tutorial. So I only have 35 minutes. Um, so what you could do is um, for the next lab, whatever I do, I could try and follow. That way it's, uh, it's the same time. One a little larger, okay. Okay, so uh, I'll try and continue, try and get, the, get this done in the next half hour. Um, so for the next lab, it follows a similar procedure so that you can try and follow at the same time as me. Uh, so it's easier for you. And um, so the integration and provisioning, I'll introduce some of these ONA, Prometheus, Kafka, et cetera, for you to get an idea. So um, under OPNV, there is another project called NSB, Network Services Benchmark. Uh, benchmarking, uh, where it's a framework where you could uh, leverage the existing um, VNFs, uh, so whatever VNFs you have, like sample VNFs or commercial VNFs, so you could deploy that VNF in within a set of nodes, um, and you have the traffic generator um, and the OpenStack deployments. A lot of this is integration done using OpenAV framework, and uh, what what this project provides is. Um, uh, characterizing your VNF across a set of KPIs so that um, you, you're not only getting the performance numbers through pool latency, et cetera, but you're also getting the related um, telemetry from CollectD. So you have a same, you're getting the state of your machine while it's being benchmarked, and uh, using that data, you could actually uh, leverage and run some machine learning algorithms on top of it. That way, um, NSB provides you the framework to get that relevant data and your state of your VNF service. So you could, uh, it's all open source. You could check out in the NSB page under OPNV. And then uh, let me quickly introduce you to Prometheus. Um, how many of you heard of Prometheus? Yeah, almost a lot, of, quite a few folks, because this day and age, it's a uh, most common um, time series database come um, uh, you know, uh, visualization software, uh, Prometheus. It's an open source uh, monitoring and alerting toolkit. Um, so Prometheus is uh, pretty simple. Uh, let's see where my mouse. Yeah, so uh, on each of the node, uh, so CollectD is, uh, the way CollectD pushes out is, um, pushes out the metrics, the way Prometheus works is pulls the metrics. So what it does is creates a particular endpoint, particular port it's, or particular endpoint that's exposed to. It keeps scraping at a particular predetermined interval, and it, it can uh, pipe in that data. Uh, what, so there's a bunch of exporters that you can write or use uh, out of the existing exporters. In this case, collect the exporter, and there's node exporter by default on Prometheus, which gives some a few basic met metrics. And, it, and there is also CollectD exporter, which can um, expose all the metrics from CollectD. And these metrics are pulled in, and there is a time series database that is available within the Prometheus. And uh, there's a HTTP servers which can, um, that are running that can uh, expose the metrics uh, to like using graphs or uh, query that endpoint, HTTP endpoint, and you can actually visualize the metrics. Uh, however, it's not as powerful as what you saw in, um, in uh, Grafana. For example, um, for Grafana here, I can do quite a few things, right? So you can last 30 minutes. 
um, or you can change to five seconds, apply, change the x-axis, y-axis, play around these, um, and can uh, visualize from multiple hosts, multiple data sources. Um, there is, um, uh, for example, CPU usage. It's another customized one. Data points out of range, interesting. Host overview. Right, so PMU is um, not available, not enabled here, so you see this here. Uh, MCU log words, so each of the plugin, you can customize the page and have a uh, play around with it as you want. However, with Prometheus, you would see in a few minutes how, how it visualizes the data. So um, from barometer perspective, what we did was um, uh, built a Prometheus container that we have, um, um, uh, we leveraged in doc, um, under parameter Docker Hub. The, the biggest advantage of Prometheus is it has an auto discovery feature within your Kubernetes cluster. So it discovers your, the, your services and your containers and pods within your Kubernetes and gets the application metrics. And that's why it's very, very powerful and popular. The fact that it automatically discovers your entire Kubernetes cluster, get the relevant application metrics and for you to be able to query and process the data. Um, now, while I introduced Prometheus, I want to introduce you Red Hat's telemetry framework, um, part of Service Assurance Framework, for the fact that, um, you know, so you saw CollectD, you saw Prometheus, and now if you want to use this in production, uh, how, what is an example that you can use, right? And Red Hat has done quite some work here. So a lot of this is open source. Um, it's a telemetry framework. Uh, it's an application running on top of uh, OpenShift. OpenShift is a commercial offering of Kubernetes. Um, using a lot of these components, Prometheus, Smart Gateway, CollectD, et cetera. So now you have, let's, say, let's assume you have hundreds of nodes. How do you get the data in a way that uh, now you, you, you have a, a scalable way of getting this data? And that's what Red Hat uses um, AMQP. Uh, for example, there are quite a few buses out there, but Red Hat uses uh, AMQP, um, AMQ bus, uh, based on AMQP protocol and uh, have a way to pipe this into the smart gateway so that Prometheus can pull from one single endpoint instead of Prometheus scraping from hundreds of nodes. So the way they integrate with the smart gateway, it provides a one endpoint for Prometheus to scrape it. So telemetry framework within Red Hat um, exposes a lot of these data from CollectD and uh, you can visualize using Prometheus. So let's quickly look at Prometheus demo. I don't think I'll have a lot of time, but um, try and go through this fast. So since we are using the same node for everything and the same set of scripts, the scripts deploy CollectD from scratch and uh, pipe it with Prometheus. So what we want to do is um, stop and remove these containers. Docker stop. Um, so these instructions are provided in the Etherpad, uh, but uh, if you want to follow me and do it yourself, you can do it too. Takes a few seconds. Now if you do Docker PS, you don't see anything running there. And what we'll do is uh, open the default.inv and comment out Grafana and InfluxDB tasks. If you're an Ansible expert, there's easier, easier way to do this, but um, what we're doing is just enable Prometheus host and save it. Just uncomment, so you have CollectD and Prometheus. Those are the only two parts that are uncommented out. And now again, all you have to do is run the Ansible playbook with the Click the service .yaml file, run it. Goes through the same thing, deploys all these containers. <coughs> so Prometheus um, scrapes the data from a port 9090. So in the previously you saw the tunnel being established to port 3000 for Grafana. Now we have to change it to port 9090. So, so that way you can actually re receive the web page from Prometheus. So while this is running, you do change settings for the window that you're working with. Tunnels, remove this. And instead, 
do 90.90 here, and the same IP, do 90.90. Click Add. Same thing that you've done previously, now you're just opening the port 90.90. Apply. And this just completed deploying this, so Docker PS. You see two containers running, Prometheus and CollectD. Um, so all this is in Etherpad, but for the folks, rest of the folks, I'm doing it here. And now what you do is now both the containers are running. So 3,000, it doesn't work anymore. That's why you don't see anything else here. Rather, do localhost 1990. And there you have it. So Prometheus has a web server running, and then you're retrieving it. So the UI is a little bit different. You can customize it um, based on what you want. But what you see here, tons of uh, CollectD metrics that are available here. So CPU frequency, and click Execute. And you see here the graph. You see a ton, very wide variety of metrics and the frequency of the cores that are going higher and lower. There are multiple cores, cores on the system, so you see uh, multiple frequency values. Um, or you can say um, over here, like leave this and click Add Graph. And here you select another metric. Um, for example, what do we do? Memory. Everybody understands memory. So, yeah, click on Graph. And there you have it. You don't have a lot of processes running, just collect D if you OS processes, so you see memory here. So if you think about it, there are quite a few metrics that are collect D is exposing and Prometheus is scraping. Context switch, disk statistics, PMU counters, which is performance monitoring unit counters, IPMI, fan speed. I don't know if IPMI is exposed. Yep, fan speed data works. So you can look at the fan speed of uh, uh, fan speed on the server that you're running this. So you can play around with this all day. Okay. For the folks who have questions, maybe I'll try and complete, and uh, I can come back. Okay. So before we move on, um, um, I would say stop this because for the next uh, tutorial. We're going to reuse the same scripts. So, okay, while well, you stop it, Prometheus fails, you close it. Okay, now back to the presentation. Okay. Um, I'm almost about to be done. All right, so now you saw metrics and statistics from the node level, but in reality, a lot of this is to be leveraged in across your service deployment. And uh, ONAP is, is one such platform, one such project uh, that takes care of deploying your services across multiple sites. We're not talking nodes, but we're talking sites, multiple clusters, multiple <coughs> sites. And that's what uh, Open Network Automation Platform provides you. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this is quite some complex uh, uh, set of software uh, for you. It has a multiple components, a policy framework, someone asked about policy, like a you know, policy framework helps you establish what policies to be taken for your services. DCAE, uh, which is what is the topic of interest here, data correlation and analytics engine, which gets the data from metrics from all the nodes and uh, helps you process, like take corrective action, uh, orchestration, AI projects, so, and then there's uh, controllers, multiple controllers here. Um, and this is an example of uh, how uh, ONAP projects are divided. And there are focus groups of people working on each of these subcomponents to uh, bring these things together. Um, so what is ONAP? And addresses need for global scale of automation. So you can have data center sites, edge sites, uh, multiple clusters being controlled, instantiated, provisioned, resource managed using ONAP. And, um, and frameworks allow you for policy, control, behavior, analytics, closed loops, et cetera. And I speak with a few folks uh, from Control Loop Subcommittee with an ONAP, which are, they are looking at closed loop automation from an ONAP context. One of the things that ONAP considers is VES, VNF Event Stream, 
It's a data format that was originally um, submitted or proposed by AT&T. Uh, VNF event stream, so the idea is you have tons of VMs. We're talking about nodes right now, and the hands-on is about nodes, but you have tons of VMs and VNFs that are instantiated on top. But how do you understand and leverage um, data from the VMs? That's where VNF event stream comes into play. It provides the common ev uh, converged event stream format uh, for you to simplify closed loop automation. Um, so in the demo that we'll see, you would see the, the how does it takes the metrics from CollectD, for example, and packages it in a way that it correlates to the node, it correlates to the VM, and helps you get the data out. And uh, DCAE leverages, uh, DCAE known app leverages WES. Um, let me introduce you to briefly another framework called Kafka. Um, anybody heard of Kafka? Yep, okay, that's great. Now, it's a pretty popular mainstream right now, uh, originally conceived by folks in LinkedIn, and they open sourced it, and um, uh, a lot of uh, frameworks use Kafka. So it's uh, not just a message bus, uh, but it's a messaging system across distributed services, um, and it has a PubSub model, pub publish subscribe model, uh, where you have Kafka connected to multiple applications and um, applications publish and there are subscribers that subscribe to get the data. And why should you care about Kafka? Uh, if you're building um, a scale, like a um, heavyweight system, have a huge scale, what Kafka can do is uh, build a real-time streaming data pipelines. Uh, if you heard of the term streaming analytics, uh, a Kafka can help you perform streaming analytics query on the data while, it's, while still it's in motion, query on the data, process the data, and then um, enable new events based on the data that is still in streaming. And that's why Kafka is very powerful, um, being more than just a, a bus, real-time data bus, right? And uh, build real-time applications to react to streaming data. And traditionally, you have the data, put it in a database, time series database, or you know, a traditional database, and batch processing or, um, you know, so you have the database and then you process the data on top of it. However, Kafka is uh, stream processing, so while data is in streams, you can process it and then use it. And Kafka does this by introducing some of these concepts, um, something called topic. Because of the time, I won't go into a lot of details, but this is just to give an idea. Kafka uses the concept of topic where each publisher uh, would write into a topic a stream, or a stream is something else, but a topic, where a topic will have multiple partitions and um, the data is captured uh, in, in these uh, partitions. And um, the powerful thing is uh, you can replay the data, so the data is not lost. Like, you know, in database, you go in and edit the data and the previous state is lost. However, given the, the, the distributed model that it has, um, data is always captured and you can replay the whole data to see how it's been edited, how it's been um, changed in real time. And uh, um, each partition you can do replicas for high availability and the brokers are the main uh, uh, entity that is managing the state of this data. There are brokers set up across your cluster, manage the state. And uh, Zookeeper, if you use Kafka, you would have heard this term, Zookeeper, along with it. Uh, Zookeeper is, is uh, simple like a database where it's managing these Kafka brokers, notifies producers, uh, consumers, et cetera. So when the Kafka was first published, you have two entities, Zookeeper and Kafka. But however, right now, the company Confluent packages both at the same time, and you need both of those um, to use Kafka. Let's do a brief uh, demo where you, you can export the CollectD to Kafka and then to um, and convert into a VES format, and you print it out on your command line. You don't need a web browser right now. Just print it out in the command line for you to get an idea. All right. Ensure nothing is running. Um, go to same default.inv, and I would comment out Prometheus, and comment out Kafka, Zookeeper, VES. And the host that I have, uh, let me check. Okay, so this time I would run it with collectdvest.yaml so that we are implementing the tasks here. 
So run this command. So deploying CollectD, Kafka, Zookeeper, and um, make sure the ports, the, each one listens to each other, and deploying that, and that's done. So Docker PS, so you, you can see uh, VES, Kafka, Zookeeper, CollectD running. So now what we'll do is, um, the ideally, uh, VES, for example, um, so, um, Kafka writes to this port, 30,000. Uh, that's what we configured as. So instead of exporting it to a web server, I mean, VES is a data format, right? So what we are doing is converting the collect the data into VES format and writing to this port. In your environment, um, so you would take, pick up the data from this port and use it in frameworks like DCIE, where you leverage this data and then do something with it. So just to make it easy, um, we just do a netcat on this port, and you would see the, the data coming out takes a few seconds. Yep. So you see here, there are easier ways to display this, but this is quick and easy. Um, so for example, uh, this one, right? Name DF complex free value. So that's the metric that CollectD is providing you, and that's the value and name and value and the necessarily timestamp uh, if you want. So VES can be customized in the way that you want. So having this in, in a way like this where you can parse it, like put, put it in a JSON files, parse it, analyze this in an easier way, run some algorithms because you have the, the fields configured, in this case name and array of fields, right? So here um, it's not just one of them, so there are subcomponents within that main metric, right? So for example, here, um, name is counter L L1 dcached source, and the, this is the value. So you can customize the, the fields, the tags, and a lot of info are surrounding your metrics, where uh, your analytics engine can leverage this and process it in an easy way. And that's the power of VNF event stream. And it's just the two fields that you're looking at. There are quite a few more. So now um, we talked about DCIE, and however, there's a, uh, under Linux Foundation, uh, there is um, another framework called PNDA, Platform for Network Data Analytics, which looks at processing big data. And if, um, so this one was originally open sourced by Cisco. Um, so PNDA provides you um, open data platform where you can um, get in data from various sources across your stack, um, a telemetry, log stash, ODL. So you can feed this in from multiple sources and, and then you have processing, various types of processing you can customize, real time, stream processing, batch processing, and perform queries, right? And uh, do a visualization um, and a lot of custom frameworks that you can integrate. So this is one framework to bring together multiple of these subcomponents and use it in a way that you can do big data analysis. And uh, uh, PNDA, it accelerates the process of developing big data analytics, like I mentioned. Um, why PNDA? Uh, these are just some of the frameworks that uh, are available uh, through PNDA. Quite a number of da big data technologies, and this, frame, this is planning to bring this, to, uh, the idea is to bring these things together so I have, you have one way to deploy this, use it in production or in real life. And so we talked about Kafka um, and uh, Avro format. Is, um, we looked at West format. There's something called Avro format that PNDA uses. Uh, Logstash is a way to analyze logs. Uh, Spark, Hadoop, all these are data, big data processing frameworks, HDFS, right, and Grafana, Jupyter. Uh, Jupyter is pretty cool. Um, it provides you a way to uh, prototype your code while you're still building it. Um, I won't go into a lot of details here, our format. Um, it's, it's a, that's what the format that um, PNDA uses. 
there's quite materials available there. Um, this is how, as example, U, uh, UI can be. Now, originally, I had, plan I had planned to do a hands-on for Red PNDA, which is a minimized version of PNDA, uh, so that for you to test and use it. Um, and if you deploy Red PNDA, there's a virtual machine available on their GitHub. Uh, download it, and when you start it up, uh, this is how it will look like, where you have a data distribution, uh, where you're getting in data input and uh, um, data processing, which is your Spark processing here, doing stream processing and batch processing, and then you're doing querying, um, and then you can relate it with your applications. There are quite a few fancy things you could do in the big data context. And when you're looking at multiple cluster level, this is one of the frameworks that'll help you. Right, so it can integrate multiple managed systems, east-west traffic, not so traffic. Um, and what we have done is um, uh, put the pipeline in so that the, from collect D, um, you can actually send out the data into PNDA cluster. Um, there are two ways you can raw format, which is the format that you could collecting and send it out. So we're using Kafka plugin for collect D, put it into Logstash, or, 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 and then can be taken into Kafka, or directly to Kafka, and then uh, you can send it to the PNDA consumer. So as you know, PNDA uses Kafka. Or you can do a Avro format, where you do uh, format conversion from a raw data to a raw format, and that will help you, your consum consumer app uh, within PNDA to use an Avro format. So I'm introducing quite a few set of frameworks, and it's a lot to take in. Um, but if you're in the data field, if you're in, in the telemetry field, uh, this is what is industry moving towards. These are the things that are available for you, and this is what is uh, necessary to understand at least the basics of what this is. So how do they fit together? Um, I know Emma in the previous talk kind of touched it upon this, um, but if you understand this closed loops, and this is from one of the Cisco engineer and PNDA blog, uh, nicely represents the various types of closed loop that are available. You know, this long closed loop, offline feed lo feedback loop, that's what people think about when they think about closed loop automation, and use cases there, capacity planning, right, placement, et cetera. However, um, they're given the speed at which uh, the, the transformation is happening towards 5G, network slices, et cetera, you want um, things in real, near real time or real time, so that you getting the telemetry, processing it, and then taking immediate actions to guarantee your network slice, for example. Right? So, um, and there, each one has its own set of use cases, um, near real time, Traffic engineering, network optimization, placement, or uh, real time would be your service assurance, security. Uh, you, know, if you saw an event, security event. How do you immediately take corrective action based on that? Right. So, quite a few things there. And then the networking stack is it's quite complex too these days. Um, so you have a bunch of these frameworks. So, for example, real time. You know, if you talk about in hardware, like in milliseconds is real time to say, right, from hardware side. Um, there are a few frameworks like eBPF and um, available, uh, or um, you, you have hardware control within the platform. Uh, Intel, there are quite a few Intel technologies that can do, uh, detect a fault, raise the related fault alarm, and then you can take corrective action. A few of them are baked into hardware. And or near real time, uh, you have Prometheus, eBPF, that can do um, processing within the data path before it goes out, the packet goes out of the system, and then you can do corrective actions there. And then there's big data frameworks like PNDA or Acumos AI. Um, it's another framework from AT&T where uh, AT&T open sourced it, and um, uh, it provides you integration to various AI libraries, and you can deploy, manage, and um, use lifecycle management tools within Acumos AI. Um, I won't go into details there right now. But um, here's, here's how all of these things, like, for example, fit together, right? So you have a lot of these use cases, security, um, placement, self-healing, um, optimization, QoS, energy consumption, green deployments, right? So a lot of these use cases, how do you do that? Uh, you get a lot of this inf uh, telemetry from your node, the near real time or real time. Within the node, you have a way to have a local node agent 
I just getting a policy, understanding your algorithm, optimize it, and change the resources. Or uh, near real time, another way is um, going across your VNFM, OpenStack, or Kubernetes. So send it out to a node where you run the analytics, send it out across the policy to your Kubernetes or OpenStack so that you can take your character action. This is within your cluster level. And then there is a, uh, offline processing, which is your orchestrator, ONAP, OSM. Right? This is uh, offline processing across multiple clusters. This is where it comes in. So there are different layers of closed loops that you can think of, you can leverage, uh, using the telemetry that's happening on the platform and your applications. That's pretty much what I had. I <laughs>